We have the privilege of having several distinguished men of God in here that I know that love the Lord. One of the newest ones that we have worshiping with us is someone I'd like to ask to lead us to the throne of grace this morning. I'd like to ask Brother Rodney Garner, will you pray for us this morning before the service? a hymn that we used to sing a lot in our churches and when we got to a certain part it went like this what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer listen to this part oh what peace we often forfeit, and oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You know that song? This morning, I want you to think about what's going on in your life right now. And I want you to think about the part of that song that says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? Because we lack the relationship to our Heavenly Father through our prayer life. And this morning, we're going to start off by looking at a man by the name of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is going to go to prayer. And he's going to go into fasting before God. And there is something that has happened in the life of Nehemiah that has broken his heart. And he doesn't know quite what to do or where to turn, so he turns to the one that we all need to turn to when we don't have any idea of what we should do in this life that we live in. And that's an almighty God. You know, I was thinking in Sunday school this morning as we started talking about some of the children and how, how they are so innocent. You know, when I was growing up, until I got to be maybe around 12 years old, I don't think I knew anything that was going on in the house. Anything that would be disconcerting. Because from one year old or, or zero up to 11, up to my 12th birthday, the environment that I grew up in was one where I was protected. I was, I was taught what was right. I was fed. I was clothed. I was loved. Anybody else, can you identify with that? And I tell you, the only thing that I had in my mind is what time I was going to meet my buddies to trade baseball cards or go bicycle riding. That's the only concerns I had, who I was going to trade up for in baseball cards. 
because I had someone over me that took care of me. Now, folks, I I know for some of you it's been quite some time since you were below your 12th birthday or a 5-year-old or a 6-year-old. But I want you to go back in your mind, and I want you to think about the protection that comes in the home. Now, I know everybody in here didn't grow up with, with a great household or a great family. But those of you that did, I want you to think back to that time where you didn't have nothing to worry about. I mean, really, we had a time in our life when we were like that. And I want you to know that they were exhibiting an example of what God wants us all to know as adults today. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we don't carry it to God in prayer. You see, what my parents did in the home taking care of me where I wouldn't have any worries or cares. That's what God wants to do for us today. God looks at us as His little children. Just because we're 44, 84, or somewhere in the middle. But what do we do? We take on the weights of the world. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and we can't see what's coming down the road. And we carry all the baggage of our past with us as we walk day by day in life and we walk around scared. And I could talk to you about this passionately because guess what? I'm guilty of it too. I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of wanting to be in control as an adult. But knowing that I serve a God that is ultimately in control. You see, we can try as hard as we want to to make something a certain way, but God can make it any way He wants it to be. So just like our moms and dads when we were kids and we didn't even recognize any responsibility, God wants us to be so in love with Him and so rested in Him and so held by Him and talk to Him in prayer that we realize that He is ultimately in control and we can let some of these things go. That's just putting us out on the sideline and breaking our hearts. And you know what? Most of the things that we worry about, it never happens anyway, does it? Because God, in all His infinite wisdom and grace that He has for us, He takes care of us. And all of that worry is it ends up being for nothing. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, he says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Helkiah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, the Hanani, one of the brethren, came with me from Judah and asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. For the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and listened to what he did. And wept. And it says he mourned for many days. But then this shows us what he did and what we should do. He says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. 
I want to stop right there for a moment because if you're like me over the last two weeks, you've been kicked back in your recliner with a glass of sweet tea watching the Olympics at home. And you're, you've been swelled with pride and achievement as you have seen our Olympic athletes with a lot of gold around their neck and a lot of silver around their neck, and a lot of bronze around their neck. And many of them, as they stood on that center podium, and they turned, and we heard our national anthem play. That is the way Nehemiah wanted to remember Jerusalem. That is the way that Nehemiah felt about Israel. But now it has been destroyed, and the people have been carried away. The city is desolate. Homes have been destroyed, and even the wall, the mighty wall that surrounded all of Jerusalem has been torn down. This is where he is in this scripture. This is where his heart is. This is why he is feeling, it says, when he just, I could just see him almost collapsing and weeping when he gets the news of what's going on in the place that he loves, his country. I read an article this week that said that they, th these people that were speaking said that they wished every person had to serve their country at least for one year. Because we now have generations of people that don't know what it's like to have to fight for your country and to understand how beautiful it is to have a land that is free. And I think sometimes when we hear scriptures like this, it just further substantiates that in my mind that we don't understand what it's like to lose. Therefore, we maybe don't understand why he broke down and wept. And why he began to fast. And why it broke his heart so badly that not only had they lost their land, but he understood why they had not lost their land. And folks, I want to share with you, I'm deeply concerned about our community for this very reason. Do you know yesterday as we did our summer jam that the community that we did it under was... We saw the police out there patrolling because there's issues in our town. If we go to parks here in our town, we see kids doing things that they shouldn't be doing. If we just go downtown and sit on a bench around the courthouse, you're going to hear all kinds of filthy language. If you go into a place to eat, just as we said this morning, you see very few people bow their heads and pray over the food, thankful for what they've been given. And he prayed. Why? His heart was broken, but also because he said, My father's house, Israel, has sinned against God, and I have too. And he was talking to God for forgiveness so that maybe, just maybe, God would allow Israel and Jerusalem to be built back up to that place that he loved. It's beyond our mind to even think that our country could suffer such a loss as this. But as we sat in there talking this morning about money and some of those things that we live for a lot of the time. Can you imagine what would happen to us as a people if suddenly our currency meant nothing? It could happen, folks. It could happen. And at that point, what would happen to our country? And where would we be as a people? And the things that we have put our faith in, what would it even matter anymore? What would it mean? 
If just that one thing happened to us as a people, our currency meant nothing. So in 7 through 11, we see he says, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest part of the heavens, yet will I gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah started praying, God, give me mercy, grant me your will, grant me your favor. And the Lord started to fill into his heart, I want you to be the man that goes back and starts to restore your town and restore your people. And he knew that he had a huge job as a servant under another country, and he didn't know how he was going to get to go and do this. But I want you to see this morning that in this scripture, the key that Nehemiah understood was prayer. Now, I know some of us have been praying things, and we have not seen our prayers come to fruition yet. I mean, sometimes I pray things that I think God wants so badly, and I pray about things that I want so badly. And I can just feel it down in my heart and down in my stomach and in my brain. And if not, if I don't just leave it with God, guess who walks away worried about it? Me. I beat myself up one side and down the other sometimes. Because I just don't leave it with the God. You see, back to that song, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Think about the peace we all could have if we would just leave it with God. If we would just let God do it and let God take care of us and talk to Him in prayer. Turn with me over to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want you to look at verse 10. (coughs) What happens in those first seven chapters of the book of Nehemiah is God starts bringing His people from all corners of whereverville back to Jerusalem. And they start working under the supervision of Nehemiah and Ezra. And the next thing you know, they have rebuilt the wall. And they're getting ready to be inhabitants of that city again. And we see a census that was taken here in the latter part of chapter 7. And they are praising the Lord for what He has done. And we see there in chapter 8 that Ezra, who was the priest at that time, it says he began to read from the law. And there in verse 10, he says to the people, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. He says, do not sorrow. And then he says something really important here that we need to hear. He says, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now I want to tell you this morning that the joy of the Lord and the happiness of people are two different things. Happiness of people can go and it can come based on your situation. But the joy of the Lord, if you know Him and have a relationship with Him, it is something real that stays with you and it inhabits you and it helps you get through anything that you're going through in your life. 
So this morning when I talk about the joy of the Lord is your strength. In this context, the joy of the Lord is something that the people of God are experiencing. I experience the joy of the Lord on a daily basis. On the day that I stood in line at the funeral home of a loved one and people come through shaking my hand, I was still experiencing the joy of the Lord. At the day that my wife gave birth to my two beautiful daughters, tears filled my eyes and streamed down my cheeks because I had the joy of the Lord. The day that I sat in there at a table in November of 2014, and this church voted me in to be its pastor, and I had my mother on one side, my wife on the other side, my mother-in-law on this side of my mother, wondering what was going to happen. The joy of the Lord was my strength. Through everything that has ever happened in my life, every gain, every loss, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It has to be for a Christian. We have to realize that it's all about the Lord. It's all about His strength. You see, it says in that verse, there's two words that I want you to look at. One is the word joy. When you think of someone that is joyful, we think of someone that has something within them that we're just attracted to. And we want it. And we want to be around it. And we want to feel it. And we want it to be a part of our life because it's something that you just can't go out and buy. Anybody know where you can buy joy? If so, I bet you could sell it by the five-gallon bucket full. But there's no place that you can go out and buy it. It has to be given to us by the Lord. But then when we think of the word strength in that verse, we think of a place of safety. God is my safety. God is my refuge. He is my protection. God is my strength. Do you know that this morning? Do you know that He is your strength and He is your refuge and He is your protection? Have you ever been so weak, even though you've got joy of the Lord? Something in your life is so out of control that you don't even know how you're going to handle it. But you know that you know that you know that deep down inside that my God is my protection. He is my strength and He will walk with me through this. He will provide that I am a person who stands behind His refuge. Turn with me over to the book of Psalm 28. Psalm 28. And I want you to see what the psalmist says about this strength. See, this strength comes from joy, folks. Let's read verse 7. Psalm 28, 7. It says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices... And with my song, I will praise Him. You know, we should have read that verse before we sung Amazing Grace this morning, shouldn't we? Let's read that again. The Lord is my strength. He is my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. As I look out at God's people this morning. And some that may need to be one of God's people. I want to tell you that in this world, no matter what you depend on, it will let you down. Whether it be possession or people. But the Lord God will always be your strength. And His salvation, once He gives it to you, it will never be taken away from you. There are people in here that all you've done all your life is lost. You've lost people. You've lost friends. You've lost homes. You've lost possessions. 
You've lost everything that you ever thought was near and dear to you. But I will promise you this morning, with everything that's within me and everything that's within this Bible, that if you'll depend on the Lord to be your strength, He will never let you go. Never, never let you go. Now turn with me back there in Psalm chapter 18, because this scripture here is loaded full of visual things that I just want you to think about this morning. Because guess what? Some of us are talking to God, but we're not talking to God enough, or we're not having the right conversation with God. Some of us are still trying to do it all on our own, and we're not talking to God at all. So I want you to understand why we should go into prayer like Nehemiah did in the scripture we read earlier. Here in Psalm 18, 2, it says, The Lord is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. He is my shield and the horn, which means strength of my salvation and my stronghold. Folks, this morning the Lord wants to be your rock. I had to laugh when I saw some of the pictures that Tony and Lee Pittman had posted on Facebook this week of their mountain vacation. Because here was this huge rock and little Lee was sitting about this. She looked about that tall in the middle of it sitting there. And I had to remind them in a post that the Lord is the rock of our salvation. And if we have our feet established and set on a rock, guess what, folks? Everything around us can fall away. Everything we have might be gone, but we can still have that joy of the Lord because He is our foundation. When you think of a fortress, you think of something really strong and something mighty and a place that you would go into and you would be protected. The scripture says that the Lord is my fortress, and the Lord is my deliverer. What does that mean? That means when we get ourselves in trouble, God helps us get out of it. Anybody in here good at getting yourself in trouble? <coughs> I'll tell you the first way not to get in trouble. Listen more than you speak. Because a lot of times, that's what gets us in trouble the most, isn't it? Well, womp, 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 right? And then it says here that it is, he is someone that I can trust in. One of the things that breaks my heart the most in our churches is when people say, I love you. And then the next thing you know, you don't see them anymore. Does that break your heart like it breaks mine? People come over to your house. They have a meal with you. <coughs> Talk about your kids. Share hand-me-downs from their house to your house. Play together. Go out and eat together. And the next thing you know, <laughs> They are gone. Nowhere to be found. But all at one time, everything just seemed perfect. You see, we fail each other, don't we? Because we're imperfect. But in this scripture that the psalmist wrote, he wrote that the, our God is a God who we can trust. Because He is unchanging. He's the same as He was in the beginning. And he'll be the same in the ending. So it's someone that we as people who are very fragile, we as people who have a longing to have things in our life that will never change, we have a God. And it says we can trust in him. And then it says that he is our shield, he is our horn or our strength, and he is our stronghold. I don't know about you, but I feel better just by reading this scripture. Let me share something with you. How many of y'all have a prayer time at the beginning of the day? 
How many of you wish you had a prayer time at the beginning of the day? Let me share with you, if you get your Bible out, and especially turn it over to the Psalms, before you get ready to pray, and you start seeing in there that, guess what? They were experiencing the same things that I'm experiencing. They felt the very same way on the inside that I feel today. And you start reading how broken they were at times and then how God lifted them up and how they spoke to God and, and they praised God and they told God that He was all of these things because they trusted in Him. It will lift your day if you can let these things run through your mind if you belong to God. And you start your day understanding that our daddy, God the Father, is going to take care of us that day. It will make your day a whole lot better, and it will make it go a lot easier. He is my deliverer today. Turn with me over to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And I want to just read these verses. And then I have one scripture in the book of Galatians that I want to read, and then we're going to close this morning. In John chapter 15, verse 1, I want you to see these words. This is a relationship between the believers of God, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and that relationship with us and Jesus Christ. For he says, I am the true vine. Now you think about what I said earlier about when you were a child and you were growing up in your home and you had no worries, you had no cares. You didn't think that you had to be responsible for everything. You didn't think you had to change everything. You didn't think you had to buy everything. You didn't think you had to be a good mama or a good daddy. You think back to where you were a child and where that strength was coming from that made you feel so carefree. It was coming from those earthly parents that God made parents to show us as people what God wants to be to us. And you think about that when I'm reading these scriptures. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that, he may, that they may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He says, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. For I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. For without me you can do nothing. You can fool yourself. You can make yourself feel like you're doing something. But without Jesus Christ you can't do nothing. Hear that this morning. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and by, abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Listen, my joy, the joy of Jesus, may remain in you, and that our joy, which is the joy of Jesus, will be full in our life and in our bodies and in our lives. Isn't that good stuff right there? 
But the scripture says that we have to abide in him. Nehemiah abided in God. Nehemiah cried and he fasted and he prayed and he asked for God's best and what God wanted. And God wanted him to go and rebuild Jerusalem's walls. What does God want us to do today? Our last scripture this morning comes from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. We just talked about Jesus Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. I have seen all this summer how it takes a seed growing up out of the soil and becoming a vine or a tree or a stalk to produce much fruit. You've got to have the vine first before you can have the fruit. I mean, wouldn't it be funny just to go out to your garden and you plant some okra seeds and the next thing you know you got okra just laying on the dirt. And no, no stalk to cut it off of. It don't happen that way, does it? First, you've got to have the vine or you've got to have the stalk that grows. And then comes the fruit on that. So I want you to understand as we read this scripture here, this is given to us by God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the second one is joy. Peace. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, I say this because we know that the fruits of the Spirit are gifts that we get through God as we grow in the Lord. So we see here... That joy is one of those things. And to be able to get joy, which is the fruit, we have to grow in the Lord. We have to have the vine. We have to have the branches. We have to have all these things. We have to abide in God. We have to be watered. We have to be fertilized in our lives. We have to have all these things to happen. And we have to have conversation with God in prayer. Our heart has to be aligned with God before we can have the fruit, the joy of the Lord, and the love, and all these other things. So I ask you this morning, I have hard circumstances in my life. I'm just going to go ahead and confess. As a father, man, I tell you, my life's been a circus the last couple years. This year I have a daughter that just went into high school. And guess what? I had another daughter that just started college. As a father, my life is a circus right now. And the things that are, are going on and the things that they're having to do... And you know what? A lot of times because... I, the protector, can't figure it out on my own anymore like I used to when they were this size. I get upset. I get all up in my head. And I start thinking about different things. And guess what? I don't have control over that anymore. It all belongs to Him because they belong to Him. This morning I would invite you to stand with me because if you think in your life that maybe you just want a little too much control in your situation. But in you controlling things, you don't have the assurance that things are going to come out right because guess what? You haven't gone to God. You haven't prayed. You haven't asked God yet. God, what do you want in this situation? God, what do you want me to be? God, I can't hardly stand it anymore. But I know that you are my rock and you are my shield and you are my fortress and you are my salvation. 
Maybe we've not acknowledged that yet today. So I want to give you a time today, like Nehemiah, how he came to God and he said, God, I want to pray for my country because they have walked away from you. And God, I want to pray for my household because my household is also full of sin. I want to give you an opportunity today to come before a God who wants to take care of every one of us. And if we haven't given our lives to Him, give your life to Him today. If you have problems in your life and you haven't given those problems fully to Him, give them to Him today. If you see things in your society that make you sick, give them to Him today. If you have things in your own home, and maybe you've already dulled your senses to the sin that you're committing in your own homes. I pray that God will awaken them in your conscience. And that you'll come and that you'll give them to him today. Jim, will you play some music?